we are recording. So, good afternoon and welcome to Praxis Peace Institute's Planetary Pause series. I'm Georgia Kelly, the Director of Praxis, and today we have an inspiring guest, Lenny Siegel, who actually was a housemaid of mine back in the 60s, uh, and he has attracted some other leading luminaries from the activist movement of the time, which we're very happy to host today too, or to have on our program. So from being a radical activist and a member of Mountain View's Planning Commission, City Council, and finally presiding as mayor, Lenny Siegel's activism has spanned many roles through the years. In addition to being a key player at Stanford University's anti-war movement in the 60s and early 70s, Lenny was a leader of the Stanford chapter of Students for a Democratic Society, the Stanford Anti-Draft Union, and the April 3rd movement. He also coordinates a national network of Stanford alumni activists who have been meeting every five years and sharing information via email in between. He has been president of the Pacific Studies Center, has served as executive director for the Center of Public Environmental Oversight, and he's also one of the environmental movement's leading experts on military um, environmental issues, which is kind of a unique position to have. He is the author of the just published Disturbing the War, here it is, the inside story of the movement to get Stanford out of Southeast Asia. I highly recommend this book. I just finished it two days ago and felt like I was living through the whole thing as I was reading it. So uh, one, one thing I thought was interesting, a quote from the Mountain View Voice, which is a local newspaper there, um, had mentioned in their endorsement of him for city council last year, they said, Siegel combines a strong moral compass with a collaborative approach to problem solving and a pragmatism born of years of working with federal agencies and local governments. He's not shy about taking up unpopular causes, but more often than not, he's been on the right side of history. We can attest to that. So welcome, Lenny. Great to have Good you to here. see you, Georgia. Yeah, great. So I want to start with um, something from your book. I just finished reading it, as I mentioned and found myself living over again some of the scenes and learning a lot about the ones when I wasn't there. And your book not only sets the record straight on the anti-war movement at Stanford, which I think is very important, but you've also created a compelling narrative about the movement that brings it to life again, pretty much in vivid technicolor after all these years. And reading it, I was struck by how the media often ignores or doesn't notice the constructive aspects of protests, sit-ins, and rallies. And I'm thinking particularly about the discussions and deep learning that took place in the sit-ins and the teach-ins. Many young people were educated during those events. And I'd like you to tell us something about how that worked, what you learned, what you were able to teach others, how the um, learning aspect of the sit-ins and the teach-ins were so important to growing the movement. So uh, when the anti-war movement occupied a building at Stanford, uh, we used it as a base area. We didn't lock the doors, we locked them open. And so we invited people to, to, to come in and talk to us. And we held, usually in a courtyard, open meetings where we every day we'd debate whether to leave the building. Uh, this is sometimes more than once we would do that. But in between the big meetings, which were dominated by the, the loudest people, we would break up into small groups and, and talk. And we'd be talking about what we were doing there. We'd talk about foreign policy. We'd talk about ideology. And that gave everybody a chance to be heard. And so the, the people who were the way out front had a chance to let their ideas be known to people who were newcomers to the movement. And the people who were newcomers to the movement helped check the people who were, who were way out front. So it worked really well. And we did it just about all the, the sit-ins in my book. There's a picture of a circle of people sitting around uh, in the courtyard of the Applied Electronics Laboratory. And interestingly enough, the, the guy standing up behind the circle is a, turned out to be an FBI informer, testified before Congress. Uh, so we did a lot of that. But we also used the sit-ins as a base for organizing the campus. So in April of 1969, when the April 3rd movement occupied the Applied Electronics Laboratory for nine days, we discovered they had a print shop. And we discovered in the print shop there, some of the staff were moonlighting, printing anti-sex education literature um, on Stanford's time. So we took over the print shop and decided to use it for our, our use. 
And I figured we printed at least uh, three quarters of a million sheets of paper. And every day, uh, people taking part in the sit-in would fan out across the campus to the dorms and departments, circulating newsletters, brochures, all kinds of information, uh, many of which are documented on the reunion website and are linked to in the book. Okay, and I wanted to ask you a little bit more about the organizing you did in dorms, high schools, and with with uh, local organizations that weren't um, didn't have student involvement. Because I thought this was a very interesting aspect to what you were doing and what you wrote about is the fanning out, not just with with literature, but also talking to people in the dorms, talking to high school students. How did that work, and what might we learn from it today? in organizing. So one of the things I remember, we had a group uh, around 71, 72, called the Association of Young Crows. And these were mostly young undergraduates. And it was a takeoff in the name of the electronic warfare fraternity that we were protesting. And uh, we would hold popcorn parties in the dorms mm -hmm. and invite people to come talk to us. And that was a, a really good way to interact with people and, and educate them about what Stanford's role was in the war in Southeast Asia. Uh, it's not the only thing we did. We, when we were challenging SRI, Stanford's wholly owned subsidiary for its war work, we went and met with the SRI employees. Uh, when we could, we tried to give talks at the high schools. Uh, sometimes we were kicked out. Uh, but uh, the, the idea was that there was an interaction between direct action, whether that be roaming campus, throwing rocks at windows or sitting in nonviolently, um, there was an interaction between that and education. So, you know, we'd take an action, like we broke into the board of trustees meeting because we wanted them to meet with us. And people would say, why'd you do that? That's terrible. Uh, I'll never hear, listen to you again. Why did you do it? And we talk about it. And then we go off and do other actions based upon the people we brought into the movement through that. And then we return to scaling back and talking to people. So moving back and forth between education and direct action was what made our movement tick and which made so many of the people who we brought into the movement lasting activists throughout their lives. And that I think we can attest to seeing the reunions of these activists over the many years since then, uh, how many of them are still really active politically and socially in their communities. It's been very inspiring to see that longevity of activism in, in all that group. I wanted you to mention a little bit about the work that Stanford was doing so that we know people understand why this protest was so important. When we talk about Stanford Research Institute, the uh, Applied Electronics Labs, the different uh, entities that were associated with Stanford, either because the board members were the same or they were in somehow connected to Stanford and why this was so important to uh, protest their, their work supporting the, the Vietnam War effort. So what we now know is Silicon Valley began as what Stanford Provost and Dean of Engineering Frederick Terman called the Community of Technical Scholars. It's what attracted me to Stanford in the first place, the idea that the university and private business would work together and develop technologies. What I wasn't told when I applied to Stanford is that the Defense Department was an important partner in this. And the Defense Department back in the 1960s funded most of Stanford re Stanford's research funded the bulk of SRI's research and people who were trained in the in sciences and engineering were drawn into working for these companies that were producing military weapons uh, and technologies. So Stanford was developing the electronic warfare, electronic battlefield technologies at the basic level that were ended up being used in Vietnam. So those of us who were on the campus said, wait a minute, we're part of this war effort. Uh, our institutions should stop taking part. And that was not only just the university itself, but the wholly owned subsidiary, the Stanford Research Institute. These were two of the largest nonprofit receivers of Defense Department contracts in the country. And we said, stop classified research, stop war research. And instead of trying to get rid of SRI, we wanted SRI brought closer to Stanford and have its research controlled. But SRI never did sever from Stanford, did it? If I no, it was severed. They, they sold it off. Okay, and, they uh, and, the uh, and but you know we caught them in uh, during the Laos invasion. We caught them uh, a research a, a, an SRI researcher using the Stanford Computation Center to do war gaming for amphibious assaults, and that's what led to the occupation of the 
Stanford Computation Center by the anti-war movement, because al although they said we aren't part of Stanford, they were using Stanford's research resources in support of the war. You know, another th interesting thing I thought in reading your book, uh, because a lot of this took, took place after I was around there, um, were the conversations you actually had with trustees and with people who we wouldn't normally expect would either be available or um, I, I loved your story about the, the faculty club um, kind of invasion. You, you remember which one I'm talking so about? So this is January 14th, 1969. It's what ended my academic career. Um, we invited, the SDS invited the, the trustees to meet with us. And then we went to, the, uh, to their meeting room at the alumni house and turned out they were having lunch. Uh, they wouldn't come meet with us, so we went to where they were having lunch at the faculty club, and um, I was, you know, used a bullhorn inside the faculty club to read our demands to them, and eventually we pushed our way into the room where they were meeting, and rather than meet with us, they fled. Um, we weren't going to hurt them, but they didn't want to talk to us, and uh, some of the SDS members uh, ate some of the trustees' eclairs from their lunch, and a lot of people on campus held that against us. And as, as I said, this was the event that led to my, the end of my academic career. And it always bothered me that it ended my career as a physics student, but I didn't get an eclair. Oh, that's too bad. So uh, how did this come about that you actually were expelled from Stanford? What was the process? So there was a trial of 29 of us, and we were accused of break, breaking the university's policy on disruptions. And we were told to pay a fine to the Martin Luther King Scholarship Fund. Uh, for our for our errors of judgment, and uh, we said we'll pay the money to the Panthers instead. Uh, they the university didn't accept that, so they wouldn't let me register. But I got to say, at that point, you know, I would have been a, starting as a senior in physics. Um, I wasn't that excited in continuing my scientific career because at that time it appeared that all of the options available to me were essentially doing war-related work. So. You know, there's no problem for me that the fact that I wasn't allowed to register. And then after that, every time there was a sit-in on campus, I would get a notice from the Judicial Council uh, that I was going to be tried. I was eventually suspended, whether or not I'd been there. I was a usual suspect. <laughs> a usual suspect, yes. Um, yeah, I think that's interesting that um, you really saw that it wasn't necessary for you to be there as a student to actually be organizing there for the next few years. So Actually, let me, more time. Yeah. So let me take off from the Jan, that, that, that January meeting. As a result of that, the trustees, five trustees agreed to meet with um, uh, a panel of, of students in front of in Memorial, Memorial Auditorium, which holds about 1,400 people. And uh, this was a, a key event that convinced the student body and the community at large that we were right about the trustees. And so I can't remember whether Jeannie Friedman's on the call, and I can't remember whether this was before or after Bill Hewlett, the founder of Hewlett Packard, told her to shut up. But he basically lied about FMC Corporation that he was on the board of making nerve gas. He said, I talked to the president of the company and they don't make nerve gas. Well, he's, and then he admitted under, under pressure that uh, they had just sold the plant to the government six months ago. That was a turning point for the Stanford movement. Before that, and the daily editorialized, SDS hasn't built a mass movement, no one supports them. But at that meeting, when we were able to confront the trustees with the facts, well-researched facts, and research was the heart of our movement, we convinced people that we were right about the trustees and we were right about Stanford's role in the war. Yeah, very important. Uh, I wanted to ask you about some of the um, discussions that took place that I found very interesting reading about in your book where, uh, there would be disagreement in the discussions maybe in a sit-in, and yet there was always a way to work through these disagreements. Nowadays, it seems like we're much more polarized in disagreements. We either think we have all the answers or uh, it's very difficult for people, and I don't mean just left and right, I'm talking about people on the left who have different ideas, ideologies, and I have a hard time listening to people who slightly differ from them. How did you bridge that gap? Because I think you've been really good at doing that. So I think to some degree, events drove themselves. I remember in January of 1969, just before that so-called invasion of the trustee meeting, a few of us wrote a position paper saying, let's, 
let's challenge the trustees to meet with us and let's eventually have a, a sit in and not that long after the so-called investigative reporter at the examiner, uh, somebody who essentially worked for the FBI said that top echelon SDS leaders had set this all up. Well, in fact, there were about 10 position papers. We were all over the place. We, some people said, stop the demand. Some people said, we, we, we aren't a friendly organization. Some people said, let's be more militant. Uh, we were all over the place. Yet because the trust of the way this, the trustees reacted to us, people knew what to do. So we never made a decision to break into the trustee meeting, mm -hmm. but because they wouldn't meet with us, that's what we ended up doing. So that just sort of unfolded naturally in a way. Um, what are some of the things that you learned that you've been able to carry through in your life that were successes? through the movement at Stanford and maybe even a couple of failures? What, what have you learned the most from that you've been able to carry through in your life? So the most important thing for me, and this is a lesson from, from my experience and, and throughout my life, not just at Stanford, that I'd like to get across to young activists that I work with, is that research and getting the information right, getting the facts right, is critical to organizing. You really have to know what you're talking about and if you know what you're talking about and you educate people, then you're going to be able to organize them. And if you don't do that, yeah, you'll get a whole bunch of people out for an event, but you won't have a sustained campaign that's designed to meet demands. So research was the heart of what we did. Uh, it's so much easier now. I spent hours in the business library and the engineering library digging up information that, that I could find in five seconds now. Um, on an internet browser. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, but it's, it's really fundamental. Uh, the, the thing that, that, that I regret, <clears throat> although I fell into this only for a short while, is the idea of sort of thinking you're, you're better than the people you're trying to organize. That you know, we became radicals, some called ourselves revolutionaries, and we didn't like, we, we looked down on the students who were just going to class and weren't active with us. Well, if you're a student and you're organizing on a campus, you have to respect the fact that the people you're organizing are students. Just like the Vietnamese had to realize that the people they were working with were gonna be planting rice every year. Uh, you have to understand who the people are you're working with. Um, you know, there's this whole thing in the movement of you know, following black leadership, following third world leadership. Uh, they're the real revolutionaries. We don't really count. Well, we do count, we're people and we have to ally ourselves with other movements. But if we're gonna organize on a campus, we have to organize students. Mm -hmm. I think this is very well put and it's something that there isn't a lot of understanding about in the movement, I think. So I, it's very important. Before we finish with the questions that I wanna ask you, I wanna do, pose the idea if there's something that happened in that era that you would like to share with us maybe something funny something uh, life a learning experience so so the the faction of the movement that i was a part of felt that using humor and creativity was Im important to to reaching out uh beyond ourselves and uh there are several incidents or anecdotes in the book about that uh, one of my favorites, if you can see, just uh, says Lenny for Dean here. Um, in the fall of 1971, the Dean of Engineering at Stanford uh, resigned to go head Georgia Tech. And I immediately announced that I was running for Dean of Engineering. Uh, the point was, of course, is you can't run for Dean of Engineering. It's a top down appointment. Uh, the university is not a democratic institution. And these these policies, practices of doing war research are not decided by the Stanford community. They're decided by a hierarchy, at the top of which are industrialists who are members of the board of trustees. Well, I really enjoyed the fact that almost immediately the assistant dean of engineering uh, wrote a letter to the daily uh, criticizing, uh, you know, attacking me for it. And I was so happy that he had taken the bait. I, I accused him of, of attacking me because he wanted to be Dean of Engineering. Of course, neither of us had any chance of getting that, getting to that point, but it was instructive to the, to the community that, boy, isn't it really absurd 
that Lenny's running for Dean of Engineering. <laughs> uh, there was just one other story I think would be fun to communicate to people was the one that took place during the opera rehearsal. So during the April 3rd movement, this is the spring of 1969, um, we had, um, there was a big meeting of the Board of Trustees and they decided not to do what we wanted about SRI to stop war research there. So we had a big meeting in Tressor Union, the student union, several hundred people. And it was really acrimonious for fighting uh, as usual, you know, and, uh, and usually it's the Jews and the Arab who are doing most of the arguing and the, the wasps were having trouble with that. But we, we, it, was, it, was, it was a good meeting, but, you know, we had decided we we're going to do a sit in, but we hadn't decided where. And then one of our music graduate students came and said, hey, Dinkelspiel Auditorium, which was just across the plaza, uh, is open. Let's go there because we're so crowded and hot and angry. Let's go there and, and finish our meeting. Well, it turned out that the auditorium wasn't empty, um, that the Stanford Opera was finishing a rehearsal of the Rape of Lucretia. And uh, so we filed in very quietly, you know, the angry militants out to, to do one of the most disruptive sit-ins in Stanford history, filed in quietly, sat down. And when the rehearsal ended, we all applauded. <laughs> and had your meeting. Yeah, and, and fought for another couple hours. And eventually, um, you know, we, 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 we seized Encina Hall and unfortunately, uh, the right wing students got some of our hotheads to break a window with the door, even though I was already inside with my bolt cutters coming in the other way. And uh, that made that a, that sit in was largely unsuccessful. Uh huh. I, I remember one at Encina Hall. I think it was when the CIA was interviewing perspective. Uh, that was October of 67. Yes. OK, that was October. Can you say a little bit about that? That was a very interesting because the CIA was actually actively recruiting on the campus, as I'm sure right. they were on many campuses. So the, the C, you know, one of the things the university does is channel students into working for the military industrial complex. Mm -hmm. And the CIA had uh, had uh, recruiting interviews uh, scheduled for their our, our student uh, student recruiting center for what they call it. And uh, when they knew that we, that the movement was going to, to demonstrate, uh, they moved it to Encina Hall, which was the administration building. And so a bunch of uh, a bunch of our people uh, went into the building and made noise uh, to disrupt the interviews. And that led to the suspension of some students. And eventually uh, in, October, in the spring of 68, uh, we had a sit in protesting those those the double jeopardy essentially of the students who were suspended and got the faculty to vote against the administration and to reverse those suspensions. And did the CIA, didn't they cease recruiting on the campus at some point? Uh, I'm not sure. I know that the military and war contractor recruiting uh, continued uh, through, through the years. Um, and we had demonstrations in the early seventies against that. Uh, the student body officers tried to stop it, but this was part of the university. And, the, and you know, people would say, "This is you're taking away the free speech of the the CIA recruiters, the Dow Chemical researchers, the Marine recruiters." And we said, "We're perfectly willing to debate with them about the war. We just don't want them uh, using the university as a way to fill out their ranks." Right. Well, this is, I could go on and on with questions, but I know there are people in, in the audience here who would like to have a chance to ask questions. One of the things I was doing, because Lenny and I talked about showing some of the photographs from, um, from the time. Uh, let's see, what am I? Maybe we can show some of the photographs on. And I got to tell you that we put up, we have an eighth at the a3mreunion.org. Uh, site, we have links to the photographs and many of the documents that are cited in the book. That might be easier, Lenny, to do. Um, John, can you put that in the got it. chat box? Yeah, got it. Uh, I think that would be easier than to try to feel these photographs. You, you know, I comment about this in the book. You know, today each of us is taking lots of photos every day and sharing them with our friends. There aren't that many photos of those days, and I was very thankful uh, to Stanford, the library, the news service, the historical society for sharing the photos. Uh, found some things, pictures of me I hadn't seen before. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> Taken by the FBI, probably. 
Um, I think it, it was interesting that um, a few years ago, the Stanford Historical Society, and I think you put the panel together, which I was on and Jeannie Friedman was on, um, kind of setting the record straight from the former president of Stanford, Lyman who came out with a book shortly before that, and this panel showed the other side of his story, which I think was an important um, important information to get into the Stanford archive, into the historical society there. And do, is there anything you'd like to say about that? So after that, um, we started working with the historical society, but we put together an oral history project, uh, where I think at least 20, maybe 30 of us, I recorded extensive interviews uh, for the Stanford Historical Society archives. And actually my book grew out of the eight hour interview that I did. I said, if, if I can do an eight hour interview from memory, then I could probably write a book. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but it was good to, to do the research again. I used the Stanford daily archives and the documents that I had to, to, to supplement my memory because right. I didn't remember all the dates. And in fact, there, there are a couple of demonstrations where the daily claim that I, I was, you know, I, I led people down El Camino uh, to trash the Bank of America. I don't remember that at all. I, I know there was a demonstration, but I don't remember doing that at you all. probably weren't there, Lenny. <laughs> <laughs> so um, do we have some questions for Lenny? Comments, questions? You can unmute yourself when I call on you. Rocky has one. Okay, Rocky, you want to unmute? Rocky? Yes, uh, Lenny. Did you ever cross paths with Mario Zavio? No. Um, my sister had been in Berkeley at the Sproul Hall, sit, took part in the Sproul Hall sit-in, but I never met him. Uh, the person from Berkeley who was involved in the free speech movement who did come to Stanford was a graduate student with Steve Weissman. And Steve was a mentor to many of us in doing research as well as organizing. And he was actually the preeminent leader of the 1968 sit-in that I talked about at the old union. It, it did, Letty, did you ever get uh, so you know ha, ha, real help from the faculty? So there were there were some people on the faculty who were very much in, involved in the movement. Uh, people probably have heard of Bruce Franklin, who was fired for his activities at Stanford. I mentioned in the book that he wasn't really the most radical faculty member. That the the guy who always took part in synods was Charles St Charles Stein, the Einstein of the statistics department. And if we ever had a sit in, Charles would always uh, sit in. Uh, people like Charles and, and, and other faculty members, the Mar uh, Hugh Marshall, or people who actually donated money to fund um, fund uh, movement flyers when we when we couldn't seize the the paper uh, in the Applied Electronics Laboratory. Uh, so we did have support from from some faculty, but there were times the votes on ROTC, the, the votes on during the '68 sit in sit in where we won votes of the faculty that the faculty supported student activists. So uh, it, was, it was a split faculty, but there were key times where the majority came out uh, on our side. It seemed like a very thoughtful time in a way. It, was, it, it seemed easier to get people or faculty to talk to faculty, to even talk to trustees on an occasion. Um, it seems like it's harder to do that now. Maybe I'm wrong, but it- I, I'm not sure about it right now, but during the, the 1968 sit-in and the AEL sit-in, uh, we did something that may be unique to Stanford. We held faculty tea parties. Right. Uh, we invited faculty members to come meet with the militants who were occupying the building. And we served them tea. Uh, I remember the, uh, some of the women I knew who were you know, hardcore activists seem to uh, have kept the frocks that they wore for their Stanford interviews. Uh, and they, they uh, put on a show for the, for the faculty and, and the faculty got to understand that, that we were thoughtful people. Uh, we weren't just troublemakers, we were troublemakers, but there was thought behind it. And so the idea of using a sit-in to hold a tea party for the faculty is something I haven't seen uh, in the histories of other campuses. No, and it was a great idea because it does bring in people who wouldn't normally be in conversation with the more radical. So uh, again, there's this interplay between action and education mm -hmm. that I think is a success is a key to success in a long-term sustainable organizational campaign. Well put. Um, do we have some more questions? Uh, okay. 
I can't yeah. believe everybody's speechless. Ro I, I have a question, <clears throat> Georgia. Okay, Julie. I, I didn't hear any mention of the Hoover Institution at Stanford where people go to retire. Did you have any interaction with them? So there were demonstrations uh, at the Hoover Institution. Uh, there even one where activists went and they rubbed the side of it uh, because of its appearance. <laughs> but but um, I was always more focused on the engineering labs and the actual hardware research for the war. Uh, but yeah, the Hoover Institute was a, a right-wing institute on campus. They sponsored the uh, speech by Henry Cabot Lodge in uh, must have been uh, uh, January of, of 1971, where Bruce Franklin was accused of shouting down uh, Lodge, when in fact, there are hundreds of us who shouted down Lodge, and Bruce wasn't one of us, but the leaders of the Hoover Institution used that event to pick, pick Bruce out, and that led to his trial, even though he was, you know, with my testimony and others, he was acquitted of that charge. So, so we did challenge Hoover, but the, the more important thing, if you look at Stanford's role at that time and its relationship to the war was the technology of electronic warfare and the electronic battlefield. Yeah, and chemical warfare. Uh, Brian? Yeah, there was, so as you're, you're right. So Stanford did research for chemical warfare. Um, they didn't produce the chemicals, but Stanford and SRI did research on, on the dispersal of chemical agents. Right. That I saw, as you know. Uh, Brian? Lenny, this is fantastic. Really appreciate it. My question to you is, early on you said that you noticed that there were FBI informants in the groups. How did you know that they were FBI informants? What, what tipped you off to that? Well, when he testified before Congress, <laughs> Tom Mosier. Uh, you know, there were other people we discovered. Uh, you, you could sometimes tell when people showed up uh, there's a, this was an FBI, it was Oakland police when we were organizing Stop the Draft Week in, the, in just, just before October of 67, uh, there were some people who showed up at our meetings, the steering committee, and we didn't know them. And one of them gave us uh, citizen band radio and some walkie talkies, and we suspected them. So Lee Felsenstein, who ended up being one of the pioneers of the personal computer industry, uh, was working with me and Lee was in Berkeley and he gave these two guys separate envelopes with so-called codes for our demonstration. And they were brought into my house in East Palo Alto. And we discovered that they, both of them had opened the envelopes. So, uh, and they ended up testifying at the trial of the Oakland Seven people who were organizers of the demonstration. So sometimes we could pick them out. Um, Tom Mosier, the guy who testified before Congress, we knew he was crazy. We just didn't know which side he was on. Yes. Thank you. Uh, someone else? Oh, look like David has a question. Yeah. David? Hey, Lenny. David Talbot. Hi. Good to see you again after all these years. Hey, uh, this question is actually more for my son who's not here, 26 year old guy who's in East Oakland. He's working with a group that's organizing poor families whose utilities have been cut off during the pandemic water, electricity, basic stuff. So um, he's decided he wants to, you know, devote his life to activism, to organizing. And so this is a question for you after Stanford, after the anti-war movement, you obviously went on to have a lifetime of uh, organizing and you uh, got married, you raised two kids and became mayor of Mountain View. So um, what can I tell Nat is his name, um, in the way of sort of long-term strategy for how you can have a life of activism after college? Well, it, it's not hard these days to find something to be active about. Uh, there's a lot of things we need to organize around. The thing is to figure out how to support yourself while you're doing that. And you know what I did for a while in the, in the um, 70s is I was an apartment manager that paid my rent. Uh, it was a lot, was, wasn't until the, the 1980s before I actually made a, no, it was 1990s before I made a real income. I you know, made a little bit of income uh, doing uh, journalism, uh, but I think it's important to have a strategy for having an income, the subsistence income, so that you can support your organizing. Uh, I know people who rely on other family members and that 
Sometimes that works, uh, but to be able to sustain it, you need to be able to, to at least pay the rent. And right now in California, that's really hard, uh, at, least, at least where I live. Uh, you have to devote a good part of your life to, to generating income. But there's always plenty to organize around. Um, the tools that we didn't have back then of social media, uh, photography, um, search engines, they make a lot of things a lot easier, but you still have to do the same basic things, uh, research, reaching out to people, and when necessary, taking to the streets. Great. Uh, Lori? Lori? Yes, I'm, I, I'm, I am now unmuted. <laughs> uh, Lenny, this is uh, Lori Gallion. Uh, I am a former uh, city council member and mayor for the city of Sonoma. And I just want to know what propelled you to seek that um, level. I don't know whether it's a demotion or a promotion, okay, in the work that you chose to do for your lifetime. So in, I actually ran for council back in, in 70, 79, 80, 81. Uh, when I was trying to organize tenants and, and Mountain View as a majority households being rental and running for office seemed like the best way to do that. I wasn't successful. But in 2014, uh, I was organizing uh, to get more housing built here. And people who were supposedly progressive who were on the city council were against it. And so I, we, we organized what we called the Campaign for Balanced Mountain View. And at the time, the... Uh, papers were being pulled to run for council, uh, there's only one person who was supporting our position. So I tried to get other people to run and they didn't, so I decided to run. And we ended up having uh, nine candidates and four of whom supported our position for three seats and we came in first, second, third, and fifth. Uh, so I was elected uh, because that was the way to advance the particular program that we were organizing around. Once I was in office, I was able to work on a wide variety of issues, uh, but housing was the issue that brought, you know, that caused me to campaign. And, it, you know, it's like, it's just another form of organizing to me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I wanted to say I, I served eight years in my position and ours is just a um, rotating mayorship. So same, uh, same with us. Right. Same and, with us. And I had the opportunity to serve twice in that capacity. And I would say I'm also was a candidate for affordable housing as well. So um, it, it, in this community, it is like very difficult, okay? Yeah. If not impossible, but it needs a champion. And hopefully most of our electeds will be working in that effort for the next, uh, next few years until it's no longer an issue. Yeah, so, so in Mountain View, we had a strategy. We identified what were the constituencies we needed to get a majority. It included the low-income people, predominantly Hispanic voters. It included people who work for Google who couldn't, who made good income but couldn't afford the kind of house they wanted, and people who were politically progressive. And we put that together to make a solid majority. Now, Mountain View is a community where there's a, a strong history of people supporting diversity. Mm -hmm. And so we, we are leading the Bay Area in building housing. Uh, but, uh, you know, I lost my last three election bid and, and we lost a bid to, to prevent the city from outlawing people living in vehicles on most of our streets. Mm -hmm. So you don't win them all, uh, but it's, you know, again, organizing is what it takes. And, you know, so, you know, I spent hours and hours in front of supermarkets collecting signatures for a ballot referendum. Uh, you know, the kind of actual organizing you do depends upon where you live or, you know, where you stand depends upon where you sit. Mm -hmm. Go put. Lori and I actually did a lot of uh, gathering of signatures to ban gas powered leaf blowers in our town, which we finally succeeded. It took a while, but we succeeded. And that may happen statewide. I hope so. I mean, these are such polluters. And, and also one of the strongest um, anti-smoking um, measures in in actually the state. Yeah, we can't even smoke in our park, which is good. So I'm going to go to Katie now. Katie, wherever you are. Well, maybe she forgot she raised All right, can you hear me? Yes. 
Yes. All right. Sorry, I needed my computer went down, so I'm on my phone. Um, I'm very honored to be here with you, Lenny, and it's nice to see David Talbot again. Uh, I admire you so much. Uh, in my lifetime, uh, the whistleblowers like yourself uh, have been at the top of my hero list. And um, my two questions are, um, what has been the hardest part for you? And the other is what drove you and sustained you? I, I guess that, I mean, I was brought up to believe in peace and justice. Um, and what kept me going was success. Uh, success in getting other people to join me and success at Stanford to end classified research to end ROTC, uh, that we weren't just, you know, fighting unwinnable battles. Uh, we didn't win everything. Uh, our country is still based upon inequity and our country still goes to war. Uh, but I feel we made a difference and that that's mm -hmm. feeling that you're making a difference is really, really essential to, to, to moving on. And your other question was, <laughs> what was the, what was the hardest part? Well, I think the hardest part is when when you show up at a meeting and you call a meeting and nobody shows up. Oh, um, God. <laughs> That's no fun. <laughs> so so dur during the summer of 67, the anti-draft union uh, was doing really good work at Stanford and the and in Palo Alto, we'd hand out flyers at the Baskin Robbins, and we were organizing stuff the draft week. But we decided to venture way away from Stanford to Sunnyvale, which isn't too far from me now, and to going door to door, handing out flyers and trying to organize men against the draft in Sunnyvale. And the only people who showed up at our meeting in the park were plainclothes police officers. <laughs> uh, that that was very disappointing. That's not uh, but That's you know, now now I work with people in Sunnyvale on all kinds of issues. Uh, that uh, that uh, it just wasn't wasn't time yet. Otherwise. You know, back in the '60s and '70s, the core of the anti-war movement seemed to be on the campuses. They were driving things. In more recent wars, Persian Gulf War, Afghanistan, Iraq, especially, um, the locus of activity moved from the campus. Well, campuses did stuff. But we, we get hundreds of people to stand out on a street corner here in Mountain View. Uh, so some of whom were active in the 60s, some of whom weren't born yet. So uh, to some degree, the, the base of the anti-war movement, the base of the left has moved beyond the campuses uh, where, where to, for me, it started. Mm -hmm. I think it did for a lot of people our age. Uh, Alan, did you want to talk? I saw your hand up and now I don't. Yes, I'll say a few things. So Lenny, I don't know if we knew each other at Stanford. I missed the very beginning. But by the time 67 came around, I, I was pretty burned out by the movement and uh, my anger. I mean, uh, and I had been in Stanford in Austria, so I missed out on a whole big group of time period there. Uh, and I, um, I was looking through the April 3rd movement online archives. And uh, I didn't, I, one of the things I did in, I think 66 was organize a, Black Power Rally, uh, Georgia remembers that. Uh, one of I, I noticed, I looked up one of the friends of mine at Stanford, Rob Christ, Christ and um, I was involved in the free university movement mm -hmm. I, during that period of time. And then scrolling down, um, I'm not mentioned in the book at all, but I see a nude picture of myself with my um, future wife in there. And so, <laughs> It was very interesting because that was on the cover of one of the free university magazines mm -hmm. uh, catalog. So I thought. So, you know, I arrived at Stanford in the fall of 1966. So, so my archive holdings, you know, I, I collected every flyer, saved every flyer I could from that period, every pamphlet. Uh, the things I have from bef before I arrived, I only have a handful of, of documents from that period. Yeah, well, you were there yeah, in 66. So I want to go to Brian, but if there's someone else who wants to ask, because I yeah. Well, I just have, I have to leave for another meeting at five. And thank you, Lenny. It was a delight to hear you speak. And I look to forward see you. to your book. First time I saw your website, and it's great. Good work. I'm going to uh, mention the book again before we go to the next talk, because I really want to highly recommend it, Disturbing the War. Excellent book. 
fun. I mean, I just kind of romped through it. Really, really enjoyable and learned a lot. And a lot I want to think about too, which I'm sure will be the case maybe for our discussions. So Brian, I'll go back to you. Penny, given what you've told us about Stanford's role with the CIA, with the Defense Department and the military contractors, where would you say Stanford is today with regards to those groups? Are they still involved? Is, is that still ongoing? There is still military work at Stanford, but it's a much smaller share of the research budget. Stanford does a lot uh, in the biosciences. Um, you know, some of the people who were in the AEL sit-in became pioneers in, the, in, in biotechnology, the Hertzenbergs in our genetics department. Um, uh, Stanford does a lot of good research in climate. Uh, so, uh, and some of the people who I went to school with ended up helping invent personal computers and the internet for better or worse. And uh, so, so Stanford, uh, the focus of Stanford changed. I wouldn't say that there's, there's no military work, but for people who come in like I did, who want to do something other than serve the military, there are a lot of options available now. Uh, so we did make a difference. Stanford did change as an institution, uh, but it's still a hierarchical institution that's run by a board of trustees uh, and dependent upon money from the federal government. So, uh, it's, it, you know, we didn't achieve okay. everything we wanted. Of course, as time went on, we kept wanting more. Any, if I could just add something in Georgia, it's David again. Um, I spoke at Stanford about five, six years ago, and it was a speech called Don't Be a Stanford Asshole. <laughs> they got picked up widely. And uh, after my speech, a number of students came up to speak to me, and they were engineering students. And they were very actually concerned because Palantir at that point was making a heavy push on campus to recruit a number of engineering students. So it may be, I, I think you're right, obviously, that you did have a big impact on Stanford itself, but I think it's still a target, as you know, of a lot of uh, war companies, and Palantir is one of the worst, I think, does a lot of surveillance work all around the globe. Right. Um, and so I think a lot of these engineering kids felt they didn't have enough of a choice, actually, for where to go to work after uh, school. Yeah, that, that, that's always a challenge. Uh, I have a friend who's a uh, younger uh, who quit her job at Google because she was doing facial rec recognition technology. Uh, but there are options now that, that weren't available in, in my time. Uh, you know, and, and the other thing about Stanford that I, I say in the book is that, that I learned a lot at Stanford. It just wasn't primarily in my classes. Uh, the ferment of the times, the, the, uh, the teach-ins and things, uh, seminars. Uh, I learned a hell of a lot there. So the university is more than just the formal education or the formal research that, that people do. Yeah, I, I, I can attest to that. The Free University and the Experiment offered some of this uh, education to people right. outside of the classroom. I know, I remember talking to some people there and I thought, oh my God, I haven't read any of these people. I haven't read Marx yet. I haven't read Marcuse. I felt really stupid. <laughs> I thought, I've got to just spend my time reading all these people so I can have conversations. And it was a great impetus to learn. And I, I will always be grateful for the experiment and the free university for that. Now, now one thing I should say about today's Stanford students is I've worked in the last few years with group of students that are carrying on work that we started and Jeannie Friedman was key to it in 1969 trying to get Stanford to build workforce housing on the campus and you know when I was mayor of Mountain View I testified before the county saying uh, Stanford's got to build more housing for the people it employs because mm -hmm. uh, we've been working that's something I've been working on for 50 years and so I talk about that in the book too. Jeannie do you want to say anything I, I feel like you're important here. Uh, first, let me unmute. I've, I've really enjoyed um, this gathering. I missed the first one and I'm going to add it. Um, and, I'm, and Lenny's book is in the mail on the way to me, so I'm going to read it soon. Um, no, Lenny, I was a graduate student. So what Lenny is really representing here was the undergraduate. So I didn't eat the eggclairs of the trustees. <laughs> I, I um, actually um, 
uh, didn't even join SDS until my last year on campus because it was so much for undergraduates and the graduate students had a slightly different agenda, organizing teaching assistants, some union support stuff, as, as well as the war, um, which definitely was our, our major priority. I was a political science graduate student. Um, so I'm really looking forward to the book and to more of these gatherings and also trying to figure out ways to help the book get out there because I think that a lot of the lessons, not lessons learned, a lot of the style issues at Stanford are actually very important now. How do we talk and how do we argue and still stay together? I find that incredibly important now for reasons I'm sure you all know. Um, in an era of such divisiveness. You know, I can't talk to people I disagree with. Can I at least talk to people I sort of agree with? So I really like this and I'm really looking forward to the book and more of these. And I would encourage any of you who have contacts and, and you know, important places to so, talk so, to so them and get on. So Jean, weren't you part of the graduate coordinating committee that did the first research on the Stanford trustees? Yes, I was one of the four founding members of the so, graduate so, coordinating so committee. Graduate students did play an important role. And as yeah. far as breaking into the trustees meeting, uh, the guy who pushed the door open was Steve Smith, a graduate student in political there we science go. at UNI. Okay. Very well. And look what happened to him. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, do we have anyone else? Uh, in fact, you know, what you're just bringing up, Jeannie, this, this is interesting because, you know, this might be a good topic and I invite you to come to the, to the meeting. Um, next Friday, when we have our open discussion, I think a lot of us have been wrestling with this. How do we talk to people who are very ideolog ideologically bound? And uh, I certainly know a number of those people who are, we're basically on the same side, but it's very hard to um, kind of break through this barrier of, of an ideology that has all the answers. So that's one thing I'd like to pursue a little bit of a discussion about maybe next week. And Jeannie and Lenny, I'll invite you both if you want to come to that. And David, too, anyone who's on this call, actually, I will make sure you get invited. So do we have anyone else who wants to? Oh, uh, Linda has a question, yeah. Linda? I don't think I heard you mention, and I realize it's more recent, um, say anything about Stanford's um, jump on the climate change wagon where they stopped um i think funding or they they did some major thing where they stopped taking funds i think from some of the oil companies i think they dis they disinvested Disin you know, back in the you know over the years you know one of the things that student activists has done is try to get stanford to use its investment yes. its endowment uh and not invest in companies that are doing the wrong thing so back in 77 it was south africa more recently stanford disinvested in from, from fossil fuel companies. Right. Uh, that's a, a great way to organize. The thing that, that, that I try to get across to students and back then and now is Stanford isn't just a university you know, with classrooms and a football team and two basketball teams. It is a corporation. It has more land than Mountain View, has enormous investments, and you have to approach the university corporation as a whole and not just as a bunch of faculty members and coaches. Hey, Elizabeth? Elizabeth? Yes, had to unmute. <laughs> Aloha. Um, I think, Georgia, this is really fun. <laughs> it's, it's just so much nostalgia here. You've obviously brought together all us old radicals. <laughs> and I was in Berkeley in the, old, uh, in the early 60s. I'd finished university for at least my bachelor's degree, um, went on later back again to a PhD in science. But, um, you know, that was such an amazing time. And KPF Radio, I used to think of as, as my alternate university. I learned all my politics and economics and stuff from, from Berkeley's KPFA Radio, and I bless it so many times. And uh, I went on, you know, doing the radical stuff over and over. One of the great things in Berkeley was when we founded Women for Peace. 
And before long, it was called before HUAC. And, and when, when asked if we had communists in our ranks, the women delegates there said, oh, we hope so, Senator. We want everybody to join us. Would you like to join? And they just didn't. It was like that old movie, Soul to the Earth, <laughs> which was popular at the time. Uh, you know, women were so good at that friendly way of, of just knocking them flat. And then, you know, went on to get gassed in Boston in the 70s and <laughs> all those things up to now. And my, my question really is about why universities are not anymore kind of the centers of radicalism. Why do we have the Greta Thunberg types coming out and waking the world up, you know, the little kids? Here in Hawaii, for instance, Monsanto has the University of Hawaii completely bought off. And, uh, and, and here we are, you know, with now Bayer uh, and Monsanto as a single entity uh, wrecking our food system, get, making great profits from that, and then making great profits from selling us pharmaceuticals when we get sick from wrecked food systems. And here we do have a big movement on things like healthy food. Um, and, but when the people manage to do it, and we have a beautiful movie called Poisoning, Poisoning Paradise, very well done, we get the legislation done, and then the top politicians veto it again. And I really think that politicians at your level, the mayors, uh, are, are where we really have to get people involved in voting. So that's one question, whether you agree there. And, and the other one is about why the universities uh, aren't stepping up the way they did before. Well, Hello, all you old fellow radicals. <laughs> so, so I believe we have to be involved at all levels, that you know, what's going on in Congress right now with voting rights is going to be really important for local government elections all over, in much of the country. So I, you know, we, can't, we can't focus on any single level. There, there are many reasons why the students aren't the locus of, every, college students aren't the center of the movement, partly because there's so much going on in communities that those of us who were activists back then are still active. Uh, and uh, so uh, th that's one reason. A lot of it has to do with the um, student loans and the fact that people can't drop out uh, the way they did back in the 60s. And then one of the, the things that mostly men, but the women they knew, the draft was something that people faced. You know, I, I talk in the book about my own fight with the draft. Um, most of what I do is, is, as an activist is sort of a, a do-gooder. I'm trying to help other people. But I was in the target hairs of the selective service system, as were most of the other men on campus. So there was an additional, re we had an additional reason to be, to take risks. Um, in fact, throwing a tear gas canister into SRI in uh, May of 69 is what kept me out of the draft. Yeah, I thought that was very interesting reading that in the book, that what actually kept you out of the draft was getting arrested, and then uh, they couldn't draft you while you were, um, I don't know, uh, how, what was the- Awaiting trial, then on probation. Right, yeah. well, you, right. So that was another, uh, another way to avoid the draft for the time. But I remember the anti-draft union. There was a book, I think, that the Army put out. I'm not sure which branch of government, uh, of the military, that was- very thick book that had all the things that could disqualify a person physically from being a member of the military. And I remember working with some doctors um, to help people amplify things that they might have had wrong. It was a, it was a very interesting process. Um, anyone else? I, wanna, uh, could okay. I say something, Georgia? Who is it? It's Julie. Okay, Julie, let me go to somebody new who hasn't spoken yet. That's I always try to get at least one person first. John? Uh, That's fine. Yeah. I'll come uh, back was, to you, Julie. I was just going to ask, uh, I'm inclined to ask about um, technology given uh, Mindfuck comes up by the Cambridge Analytica whistleblower. In, in terms of organizing, technology seems to me the best way to organize nowadays given more people participate in social media than participate in the presidential election. Uh, I, I just wonder, you know, should we be looking to technology to organize to any degree or is that, you know, um, missing the forest for the trees or, or I, I don't know, what are your thoughts on utilizing the, I, I just feel like the cat's out of the bag as far as data analytics and 
we should be utilizing it. And the book, uh, Christopher Wiley, uh, laments his, his bringing his concerns of misuse of the data aggregation to the Silicon Valley executives. And, and they say, if conservatives are building an organizational tool, um, you know, why not just build the lift, you know, the progressive version that does the same thing, uh, you know, a competitor. So, so, so there, there are all these tools, you know, and, and, you know, being able to do layout for a flyer easily. Uh, having photographs of, of on flyers, videoing police standing on somebody's neck. Um, these are all tools that we can use. Using social media is easier than using a mimeograph machine or a ditto machine, which is what I had to do back in the day. So these are tools. And as more tools become available, we have to use them. But we need to understand they're just tools and the concepts of organizing, of building support, of moving between direct action and education are still the same. So I wish I had, you know, it's so much easier for me to maintain a list today than it was back then. It's so much easier for me to raise money than it was back then. Uh, so, I, you know, I, I try to keep up. I don't like social media that much. Uh, you know, I, I'm not as much into dancing cats but uh, but the keeping track of the police with video, you know, real live streaming video, that has such been such an important organizing tool across the country that has changed the attitude of a huge segment of our population toward policing. So it's it's useful, but again, it, they're tools. Right, and it was used well here in Sonoma County, where we now have a citizens oversight organization that over, oversees the police behavior here you know, uh, you know yeah. back um back last you know last spring after george floyd was murdered um you know the high school students here organized a very large demonstration uh they'd been locked they've been locked down and they use social media and they got a couple thousand students out for a rally in our in mountain view civic center and that was really great but they just used the tools and they didn't do the organizing so it wasn't a sustained effort. So you need both the tools and the concept of how you organize a campaign to lead to where, where you're going. And how to educate. I think that part too is still very difficult because one thing we're dealing with now that we didn't have then is a shorter attention span. And I think that does influence how people learn, unfortunately. Uh, how, how we can extend the attention span is seems to be important for real education at this point. So I want to see, um, I don't see more questions and we're getting close to the end anyway. Um, I could ask, sorry, uh, I could just ask briefly. Is it briefly. quick, John? Is it quick? Yeah, yeah, it's just briefly, how do you deal with apathy, you know, what, oh. among young people? Uh, I mean, typically people my age just say, you know, screw off whenever I <laughs> talk about anything uh, political or... Well, it's a matter of, to some degree, focusing on issues that are important in their lives. And, you know, we have a lot of young people working on rent control and other housing issues because, you know, as my daughter says, she has no hope of buying a house uh, in a way that I was when I was her age. So, uh, the, you know, and, and, and for, you know, young people of color, uh, young men of color, uh, being stopped by police. It's recognizing that any organizing campaign that you engage in has two purposes. One is to further your specific goal in the organizing. And the second is to empower people so they can move on and organize again. And so it's meeting people where they are, providing them with some context so that gradually we will make this a, a better world, a better country. Uh, but you, again, you start with, you know, what people care about. Climate's really important to a lot of young people because uh, they're going to be around a lot longer than we are. Uh, so listen to them. Great. Thank you so much, Lenny. I'm going to stop recording now. People can hang out a little bit, which they always usually like to do. But um, I'm going to cease the recording. And thank you again, Lenny, for spending so much time with us and answering our questions. Well, I've enjoyed it. The problem, you know, I enjoy telling the stories, 
Mm -hmm. But it's it's more than telling the stories. It's it's using them to understand what we need to do next. 